So my name is Nuno, um, I'm Director of Cloud Services for DD Technologies and also Acting CTO for Europe. Uh, so my background has been always coming from development, cloud, um, and basically now I, I'm in charge of one part which is part of the cloud, which is cloud, internet of things, and big data. Fairly small things, every single one of them. Um, so yeah, what else can go wrong? Uh, I also do a lot of mumblings uh, online. Uh, most recently, I haven't mumbled that much, but this is my blog, and I'm a Azure MVP as, a, as well as N Service Bus Champ. So um, if you see Yudi uh, around, tell me, um, because I haven't seen him yet. Um, so um, as an agenda, what we're going to start with is an historical perspective of this. Going to challenges. Are there any challenges in this? When you think about, what do you think Internet of Things is all about? Ideas. Connected devices. Okay. More. Is it only connected devices and devices uh, interacting with other devices? Is that Internet of Things? Big data. Big data? What else? Come on. Humans yeah. interacting with those devices. Okay, good one. Anything else? We have three people that spoke. Three people have different views. That tells us something. Um, and so we're going to then talk a little bit of what is really Internet of Things, or at least what's, um, what's the view of Internet of Things. How does it work at some samples? Just as a teaser, um, I can tell you I have a Google Glass here. Unfortunately, it just arrived. Uh, so it's not even with, uh, with the applications. It's amazing. It was supposed to arrive on Monday. Um, it just arrived. And here, um, I have an example. Uh, this is something that some of your cars have, not in a pretty box, but in what's inside. It's part of your car. It's your AVI system, in-vehicle information system. That's what this is. Um, and this is one of the demos that we're going to have, is look at how we are using today Internet of Things and we didn't even know it. Did you know that um, you have those kind of things in the cars and I can throw you some updates into it and applications and things like it? Yeah? Okay, so good. So let's start with that. So what's Internet of Things? According to Gartner, um, it's a network of physical objects that contain, contain embedded technology to communicate and interact um, uh, with their internal states and external environment. Like, what? It's like, okay, I have devices, they are physically, uh, physical objects that are in the same network. Okay, so this is offline because um, it would be uh, slightly um, reckless of my part to try to do something to a real car. Um, probably that would not be a good idea. Um, and so they are, this is in the same network. They are embedded in terms of technologies. I wasn't able to get anything else. So I brought uh, one which is uh, Linux, uh, one which is an Apple, uh, and one which is a Surface. So I didn't get anything. So I got the Google Glass also just to, uh, to put some stuff. So interacts with internal states and then go into the external environment. It's very complex to understand what exactly it is. So when we went to the underground, and how many of you knew that um, uh, before uh, that video that was showing, um, knew that um, the underground was actually using Internet of Things already? Things like 
Um, for example, where is the train? Pre preventive kind of, of servicing where you go and actually know how a specific um, object, a specific element in the rail, how is that? Does that need to be uh, replaced? Do I, because of there is that part number which I have in 10,000 different places, which have a problem, we discover a problem, can I identify all of the places in order to start to do, um, to plan to do a, a, a replacement? Or in the cars, when I understand that there is a problem which is normal in the cars and I do a recall in order to replace a part. I need to understand which part that is. So basically in the underground they say, when one system can connect thousands of devices and data, that's the internet of things. So we plug in not only the devices connected to each other, but the big data part. It's also, it's also that part. So as an historical perspective, this was the first computer, right? Two capabilities, either print or delete. It was amazing. My daughter still use it a lot. Um, so then there came a lot of new uh, differences. So for example, Bill Gates said there will be a computer in every, um, uh, in every uh, living room. Uh, then uh, Steve Jobs said there will be a, a phone, an iPhone on every people's hand and, and things like that. So one machine can do the work of 50 ordinary men it depends on the man and the machine. Um, so a lot of things have been said. Now where we are is pretty interesting. So we go into a medical practice. Have you experienced that? Who goes into a medical practice and they always are on time? I'm originally from Portugal. If there is one doctor which is on time, that's pure luck, pure luck. So I remember uh, when, uh, when my daughter and my wife was expecting a baby, we would go to the doctor and if it was less than two hours late, that was a good day. So the first thing we actually started to ask was, hey, doctor isn't here, so next time can you call me and say, hey, the doctor is like two hours late and so I can bring in. We're now starting to see people saying, oh, um, can you, uh, he's not here, but uh, is he available? Can I do a Skype call? For example, in the US, uh, the healthcare industry is changing more and more. And there are exams being outsourced in terms of analysis. And there are, in some cases, and there are attempts to start to do uh, Skype type of um, analysis. So don't touch, you go into a doctor and see a screen and you say, hello. Um, it hurts here. Yeah, let me try. It's probably going to take a while. Um, but, uh, but yeah. So, other thing is what's the meaning of life? I don't know. The computers are down. Nobody without computers. Who is able to spend the full, I don't, I don't say a day, uh, because that was too really bad. A full week without a cell phone or a computer, or anything. Do you? I go completely crazy. Um, I wanted to take my laptop to the honeymoon, uh, and the reason was we're taking pictures, and maybe the memory card is not enough, so I need to put something. That's how addicted we are. And actually, the, the patterns that people learn, one of the things that um, studies have shown is that the way you learn is now completely different. Most of people now don't know exactly how to do a specific thing, but they remember how they got there. They remember the search words they used in order to get there. So everything is now connected with, with a computer. So we don't, for example, if someone asks, um, hey, where is your office building? I have no clue. I, I know the, the, the street and everything. If you ask me for the postcode, I have no clue. I go online and search it. 
If it's not online, I just go, uh, I don't know. So one of my colleagues said, hey, where is the office address? I go, oh, the website is, out, is down. Don't you work there? Yeah. Why would I use my brain in order to store something like a postcode? Come on. So technical glitch, and the computer is saying human error. A friend of mine tells that there is um, one thing which is uh, really important, which is doing zero bug code. Do you know how we can achieve zero bug code? What do we need to do? What? Don't write any code, that's one. Uh, if you don't have users, it's pretty cool because there is no bugs. It always works. So the problem is always in the user. Um, yeah, we should edit that part. Um, so, so basically, through the evolution of things, what we've been seeing is we went from mainframes, PCs, client servers, internet, cloud, everybody, woo, cloud is, is cool, I'm one of them. Then we started to go to internet of things. And then internet of things, we started to do things like, um, okay, I have a Raspberry Pi. Has anyone played around with a Raspberry Pi or a Netduino or something like that? It's pretty cool. So one of my friends has, um, he lives in the US. So he has a very cool system that he built. He placed the camera on a peak hole and he has a Raspberry Pi. So when he's away, he basically switches the, the system on. And when someone rings the bell, you will, by a, a pressure sensor, you will understand someone is ringing. Immediately, the, the camera turns up and starts, and he will see on his phone who it is, and he will talk to that person. Right? How crazy is that? Too much time in our hands. Um, that's what you get uh, when you have um, cheap things in order for us to, to play around with. But the question here is, all of this, what this brings is, what this evolution brought us is that we have, in terms of capacity, more, faster, better. But in terms of how our human capability, it gets better, but it's, it, we have limits. We have limits. I understood uh, a, little, uh, a little while ago, I understood that we have limits, that um, not sleeping for about five days, uh, when before you're sleeping like two hours for six months, it's not a good thing. You have limits. Um, so it's, it's more important. And one of the things, which is uh, Moore's law, is if something can fail, it will definitely fail. So, and we are, when we are very tired, we tend to make mistakes, stupid mistakes that we normally wouldn't do, but we do those mistakes. So leveraging technologies in order to do that, that is always uh, a must and is always something that happens. So our personal experience has changed a lot. Do you remember about this ones? They are pretty damn cool. I remember uh, about also the first Mac um, that I used, the Apple computer. Um, that was pretty damn cool. And in high school, actually I had, uh, has anyone used the perforated cards? That was so amazing. I was in high school and s suddenly we go and uh, our teacher said, hey, let's do uh, some software. And we're like, yeah, let's touch machine. And he suddenly comes up with cards and things to do punch holes in that thing. And it's like, okay, you lost it. What's happening here? And he basically goes, so this is how it works, blah, blah, blah. And we started to do punch card, punch card and do that thing, and then go to that thing and green, 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 or oh crap, doesn't do anything. But that was the first, the first times we were, we were doing some of those. And our experience has increased really, really a lot. So remember when my first machine that I had at home was um, the Spectrums. Uh, which I um, immediately try to hack in order, no, do some cheat, uh, cheat cheats uh, in order to win every time. Um, even, I didn't even have to play. Um, so memory, weight has gone down, memory gone up, storage has gone up. I was working with a customer 
that have something like 20 petabytes of data. And they said, oh, I'm going to move into the cloud. What do you think? Should I uh, plug it in and go over the HTTP? And I'm like, are you high or something? Are you crazy? So let's do not underestimate the power of a hard disk sent through UPS. Doesn't fail. Gets into the other side much quicker. Um, we did the math. It was a lot of years in order to get the damn thing there. About 35 years, even in parallel. Um, so it's like, yeah, maybe that's not a great idea. Um, so, and now we are in an age that we have these things. So the tablets, which is, this is the Surface Pro, so it's an actual computer. They are so small and so cute. The problem is, I think my bag of gadgets and crap to plug it in, it's bigger than the damn thing in the first place. It's slightly confusing. Um, so we are, uh, the accessories are bigger. But we are now working in things like 3D printing. So one of these days I was going with a, a friend of mine and he was telling me he works in the, um, in, in um, uh, he works in the, um, in the cinema industry. He does uh, lightning, lightings in, in that. And also takes care of when you have uh, wireless uh, everywhere. And so what they did is, in order to take the edge and see that they are uh, really different, they basically got a 3D printer. They have, they opened the router, they opened one, they took only the parts, they 3D print the symbol of the studio which they were working on, and now the hotspots are actually the symbol of that thing. And they have, we plug it in a sensor, and so we have exactly what's happening. And if something happens, if some packages get lost, we immediately get a, a signal saying that that specific device is not working too well. So it's, it's starting to be cool. Body metrics, self-driving cars. I don't like that one too much because I really love driving. Um, not in the middle of London when we don't drive, we just stand. Oh, that takes the cool out of that. I, I still continue to like non-automatic cars in order to do crazy things. Um, either I actually learned to do some crazy things also in automatic, but let's not, not go there. Um, but yeah, I love, I love driving. Um, but other parts uh, like robotics and, um, for example, um, I was testing because <coughs> Uh, Aditi and STC, you guys know STC, Symphony Telica Corporation? Symphony Telica Corporation and Aditi merged together and they have a lot of building those sensor devices. Actually, I got this today uh, from them. And one of the things is trying out those things for the medical. So the stethoscope that is here, it connects into an iPhone connect it in and start doing and get everything into your phone instead of so it's starting to get pretty pretty interesting working also with a big um, a big healthcare company which is build, building devices uh, medical devices that send information and we basically can in real time understand what's happening in there so there are pretty cool things happening uh, and the possibilities are endless so this is a um, a photo of what my stupid robot is, the one that I was thinking about coming, uh, bringing, uh, but then I got this, this thing. Uh, and the reason why I call it stupid robot is because I'm trying to make him learn uh, that there are movable and non-movable objects. And whenever he's a movable object, he should ask politely, can you please move out of the way? And he does that. But then, he, everything else, he apparently understands what's movable, what's not movable. There's one, one wall. Then he goes, he stands by the wall, and he goes in loop saying, can you please get out of the way? Can you please get out of the way? And I'm like, 
One of these days, I think he's going to get kicked. But this is this is really cool. It's not expensive. It's a lot of Raspberry Pis and and uh, Legos. Um, so the possibilities are endless. Things where this is being used. Have you thought about data centers? How the cloud is able to provide this type of automation, the pricing wars? How is that possible? Do I have what's the ratio between men and the machines in the data center? So, for example, Microsoft in Azure has a significant investment. So they have, in terms of um, 190 miles of just pipes going, um, they have 2,400 uh, 2, tons of copper uh, going through. So, and in terms of this, what happens is this is two football fields. That's 17 rail railway wagons. That's the data center. Now, question, how many people are in that data center maintaining it? 45? Any, anybody goes up or down? Zero. No, zero. It's too low. <laughs> there is about two guys. One is the doorman on the outside, and the other one is the doorman on the inside. That's it. Everything else is automated. There is nobody that goes inside the data center into where the container, uh, because all this is containerized and everything. So we have all this containerized. This is one of the generations. This is not the coolest <coughs> one. There is one which is, for example, in Dublin, there is, they don't have sites in order for the wind to pass and actually um, cool down the machines. So you don't need coolers, uh, save costs again. So, but this is highly automated. What we are seeing here is everything is automated. That machine is constantly full of sensors understanding what's happening with that specific device, that specific mini device. How's that? And if more than a percentage of the devices in that container are not working properly, they will go take it out and put the new one. But before they can do that, everything in that container is going to be sent to another container and only that container they will touch and only that situation they will need to go. And there are uh, data centers where that is not even needed. The containers are placed there with a crane. So huge amount of automation. How is this possible? <coughs> Internet of things. The challenge is, is this generation is being uh, disrupted by multiple uh, different forces. Like we have everybody um, goes and we have se several different generations. The ones that go into Facebook but don't share anything or the ones that go into Facebook and share everything and anything and don't even care. So for example, uh, people that are and like to take pictures of their themselves, their children and everything, and then go and share. But they said, oh, it's secure. I sent to this secure group. Okay, that's cool. Um, everything's secure in Facebook end to end, so there is not a problem there. Um, not implying anything. Um, so one of the things that I did is, uh, because I have too much time in my hands again, I took a picture, uh, a bunch of pictures that a friend of mine had uploaded. I took it, saved it into my machine, put the small, uh, a small uh, job, which was taking all the metadata from that picture and taking the GPS signals and then creating an, uh, an historical view of that, those pictures. And so since they have like a thousand pictures, I was able to create the lifetime of all those pictures. And then with a little bit of machine learning, I could tell him that every Tuesday he was going to that place and he would drop it, her, his daughter in this place, in this side of the house. Is that a challenge? 
I knew exactly where, where we would. Is that a challenge or not? Is there a problem? Slight. Not even a problem. Another way is economic. Another way is technological. All this have threats and opportunity. What, what's the difference between a threat and an opportunity? Any idea? When can a threat become an opportunity? No, it's not when you work on a security company. Antivirus. When the risk is lower than um, than what you what you have in terms of opportunity, when the risk can be mitigated, then it becomes an opportunity. But we need to understand because the rate of the innovation that is coming, the costs of the entry in some of the things is definitely high. And that's one of the beauties when we, when we think about Internet of Things, is the prices. And so the problem statement is basically, how do I ingest? So I have thousands, millions of devices spread all over. How do I emit all of those devices information into a system and actually can process the millions of devices emitting information without creating either an inrush problem. You know what's a, the inrush issue in a system? What's the inrush in issue? So, let me give you an example. I have a service and I'm using, how many of you have Xbox or PlayStation 4? No one? I have one just to test some things which actually are games, but it's just testing. Um, so, Xbox, you're playing and it's providing metrics, telemetry. And IoT has a lot of, to do with telemetry information because we want to know the status now. And so, sending telemetry information, and it basically sends every, um, every period, it sends the information, but if it fails, I have a service on the back end. If it fails, what should it do? Because it's for me, it's important to have all the telemetry. It needs to retry. So it stores, and next time, instead of sending just one package, it needs to send two packages, right? Now imagine that everything is going, everything is well, suddenly that server goes down. And suddenly, server is not down. So, and it's it's down for about a minute. And I'm sending every 10 seconds. So I had six packages that failed. And my capacity, my capacity planning was that that service has this many uh, number of, of instances that are running. So as the service come, come in, I immediately flood the system with, instead of one request for each of the Xboxes that are connected, I have six coming. What will happen now? Because it doesn't scale that quick, I will kill it again. And it stays one minute down. And now I don't have six, I have 12. That's the inrush issue. How do I solve an inrush issue? Basically, we have two systems, sync and async, messaging. So if I fail, I immediately say, this was marked as fail. I won't try to continue to hit you. I'll basically do only a heartbeat in order to check when you are. Until then, my secondary system wakes up and I start putting my, my information into, for example, blob storage, and then put the message saying there was something there for you to process. I didn't lose it, but I didn't create an inrush issue or flooding. So this is one of the problems. Any questions so far? Interesting so far? Okay. And the last thing is, how can it, this be processed in near real time? And there are here two tricks. One is, what's real time? What's real time for you? As things happen. That, what, one millisecond? Yeah. All agree? 
So what, what's the definition of real time? So it depends on what we're talking about. If real time, if I'm talking about stock exchange, real time is one thing. If I'm talking about the automated cars, <laughs> I want the, that real time because I'm inside the car. Uh, I really want the real time to be in milliseconds, very, very few milliseconds. Uh, but if I'm going to uh, some some uh, GP or something, the real time is not that important. Maybe if we are in the ICU, then it's more. So it depends on what problem statement we're working. And so we need to define what first is real time for that specific problem, because there is not one single. Normally we go to something like a millisecond, but it can be one millisecond, or you can consider it which is a second, or which is five seconds. It depends on the business. But that's the problem, is first defining what's real time. And then, if I have, so imagine that every car has one of these, only the, the boards inside. So you know when you go to the service with your car, they open a, a socket and just plug it in, it's what's inside. Um, so every car is one of these. So now imagine that every car is sending, that is in just this street next door, is sending information about everything that's happening, temperature of the car. And this is not only one. There are thousands of sensors in your car. With the hybrids now and um, things like what's the percentage of uh, energy that I have? Should I put more or less uh, fuel? Should I use more or less of this engine? Should I, for example, when we hit, the, all the airbags are controlled to sensors and we have that information. Where am I going? And some cars have now things like your tire, front tire is flat or doesn't, isn't at the right levels and things like that. Everything in real time. We want to receive this information and process this information. So that's a problem. And the challenge is picking it to, into the Halo game. So this is actually in um, millions of messages per second. So there are some points. That it depends on the days and depends on, on the times. But there are some points there are about 14 million messages going through. And this is, this is not everything that that machine senses because there is a lot more. So how do you handle peaks of something like this or something like this? Have you used complex event processing and things like that? OK, so some challenges. So what's IoT? So again, a physical, uh, a physical object in the network. So the way we have is we have an object, which is our identity. It's the sensor which has the information. We have an edge node, which is a thing um, that is connected to, to the gateway. We have the service, which is communicating with. And we have the end user, which interacts with the thing. That's the Internet of Things. I have a node which is connecting to a service, which is providing an end user to interact with it and has an identity. It's a specific element. So how is it different, Internet of Things, how is it different from M2M? How is it different? M2M, so machine to machine communication, is normally when I have those machines, but what I do is over a controlled environment. I know exactly which devices, which, which objects I'm communicating with. Okay? So, for example, in this thing, this is a kind of machine to machine communication, because I know exactly what's in here. 
the Internet of Things is all about you have things anywhere and everywhere, like floor plans, webcams, back office, supply chain, and those things you want to store them, the data somewhere. So I want to store every. So for example, we're in the in the um, in the city with more CCTVs in the world. So all of that is being stored somewhere, and there is then we need to provide insights like analyzing when there is problems in in those streets and then it allows you to do things like predictive maintenance command and control predictive analytics and things like that it allows us to most of all allows us to have this marketplace so the internet of things machine to machine is about doing this in a very controlled environment Internet of Things is when I create this m data marketplace, is when I start to do this and imagine that I have all this from the cars. I receive all the sensor information from the cars. I then can start extrapolating and having things like, okay, so this car, which is, I don't know, an Audi uh, A3, this Audi A3, this specific model, I have this many issues and for example there was a crash so let me try to understand before through the telemetry of my car let me understand what happened oh there was this sensor that created this uh, this status there was this other sensor that created this status and then there were this discrepancies okay now I find, uh, found the pattern now what does this allow me it allows me, if I have that, if I'm creating and bringing some insights with a dupe or Spark. Has anyone used Spark? It's pretty cool. Um, and if you have Spark, which is from Apache also, Apache Spark, um, what you can have is providing a data marketplace. So imagine that we could go and understand, okay, this car has had issues, but it's not the complete list it's not the complete segment of this specific car all the A3s from this year no it's only the A3s from this year which came from this specific vendor this specific dealer shop that had this problem and so I can start actually understanding what's in there and this is interesting for who insurance companies this is interesting for who for the car manufacturers. If I have cars, if I have this information also in healthcare and I have all the status and I can put some machine learning in order to try to understand those patterns and understand all this, how much better can we get in, in solving problems and being first? So when someone calls me in, in saying I have a problem, we already know. Would that be cool? Can we do that in um, a system like our solutions that we built? Who, play, who places telemetry, not logging, telemetry in the applications you develop and you architect? No? Telemetry is critical, even more when you go into the cloud. It's critical to understand it's not about, oh, the machine is up or down. That's not the problem. How is my system connecting? How cool would it be if my system would be able to, to tell me things like, I tried to connect to this system and I couldn't, just status, and then I could have a system which looks, if there are five, ten of these failures in one minute, that means I'm having a problem, like, for example, a brownout, I having poor performance or something and in that case I switch it back to another place and that's all automated would that be cool that's how cloud data centers run for example if you go to anybody uses Azure so uh, Mark Rusinovich uh, spoke about Azure in, inside uh, Azure internals and is the new CTO from, from that division. 
Um, and one of the things he spoke about then very openly was the problem, because in 2012 there was an outage. And the outage was because of a certificate. There was a bad line of code which uh, created an invalid certificate. And that thing started to fall apart, everything. And the reason is because there is a fabric controller, which is the brain of the system, controls everything, receives the status of every device, every piece of the device. For example, SSDs, if they are running out in order to, to make, go, make it go to a different machine so that that can be replaced with a new one, things like that. In that case, one of the things, all communications in Azure are done securely internally. So you have to create the certificate in order to connect. So as soon as he created the certificate, tried to connect, certificate was, was not valid, so he couldn't connect. So he thought, okay, there's a problem, try it to another machine. That machine has a problem, that machine has a problem. 30 or 40% of the machines had a problem in that section, and he basically said, this section is having problems. What will I do? I will say that everything that is in this section needs to go to another section. But now, I need to create certificates again to move them. So, boom, second section going down, third section going down. That's automation. So when you do automation, make sure you test your code and you're not a moron that doesn't know how leap years work. Um, edit that. Um, so, and how small are those things? Because when we think about the Internet of Things, do we think about small or big things? Small only? Crane type? Okay, all small. Some examples. So this, is and this was actually slides that I put together to convince my wife to allow me to buy a lot of these things. So I did a comparison with prices and all. And at the end, she just told, you already bought them. <laughs> Why are you showing me this? Um, so Raspberry Pi, side of a credit card, um, and basically costs about 40, 40 bucks. So it's pretty cool. Then you have a thousand s different sensors. Um, I played around with things like temperature. Th those are typical. Um, but uh, then it started to, uh, to put, because I like Legos, so put some Legos and put some engines in order to, to have the wheels going and try to build the, the machine. It's pretty cool. Uh, Net do we know if you really like to develop in .NET, .NET Micro, it's pretty cool. It's about $50. It's pretty cool, also has a million of different uh, type of sensors. Uh, this Shark Cove, I didn't find the, the price so far, so it's in my, uh, my wish list. Uh, and basically has all types of sensors. You can plug it in, all types of sensors, uh, GPS, touch, and everything. Uh, this Galileo is also uh, pretty, pretty cool. That's the actual size of the, the processor of that thing. It's, so it's pretty small. So we're talking about Internet of Things. It's just small sensors that we use, right? Agreed or not? No? It can also be combined solutions. Like, for example, traffic lights. Traffic lights can be uh, connecting system. So things like Internet of Things can be as big as when I do a system, I want to have a system which is, uh, and let me see if I, if I recall the, the name of that thing. So let me show you now in here in a browser one, one cool thing. So this is a search engine for Internet of Things. <coughs> Who can tell me what this is? Ideas. Devices. Devices. Sensors. So what they did here, 
this uh, thing full, what they did is put the map of the world and put an overlay with all the sensors they could find. They have multiple systems provided. And they have some, some cool and dangerous things. Um, let's see what this is. Um, come on. Click you. So let's go to London. Ah, what a sensor. Come on. Does this work only on Chrome? Wouldn't be the first. So what we can see is when we go to that level of detail, I can see exactly what that sensor is. So things like, oh, it's, um, it's a weather station, for example, or things like it's a plane, so nobody gets lost, and things like that. Um, interesting things. Uh, so. What? No, no, this is live. This is live. This is based on um, people that is, they have an open, um, an open community, and this is what's being populated in that open community. So things like, I can hear, so there is here an environment, it's a net atmo. Um, if I go and it can, I can, start to watch this for that I need to sign up but um, I can go let me see if I can see a plane uh, different colors they have is if it's a transport or if it's um, a, it, an environment element so every different color has a different thing so this is a home apparently I hope it's a home boat, or else the home just moved. Um, so this, for example, is a cargo vessel. This, for example, is, oh, Helen Jane too is a fishing boat. Um, so we can get some cool things. So this is an aircraft. And I can watch the aircraft. So. I don't get lost, in a way. Um, actually, in one of my uh, big travels in the US, there was actually one guy at, just next to me that had a GPS device by the window. And he was following the GPS and seeing if we are on course. And I actually was like, really? So <laughs> are we on course or not? <laughs> really, you're checking if we are on course. Um, that's that's that was interesting at least. So how big can this thing? So that thing is a kind of search engine on top of all internet of things. So it's published on the web. It's published on the web. Not everybody can access to that, but that is an open community. And it's not about six billion, seventy-five billion information and or two hundred and twelve billion kind of devices, because those are the predictions. Those are the predictions. And the predictions also is right now, and why is that everybody is trying to understand how is Internet of Things going to be used? Um, it's because of this. So, for example, in banking, there are about $92 billion currently um, in, um, in uh, spending. This is a prediction for 2018. Slightly more, just slightly. This is the type of investment. And that's why, because banking is changing. Banking is changing to a more digital online banking. And that's not, I'm going to do online banking differently. No, I'm going to do everything differently. Because there are new banks coming every single day with no legacy, no nothing. 
and that is changing the game. Things like bitcoins are changing the way we live. So all of this is important. So in terms of taxonomy, we have four parts. Large, like ATMs and, uh, and for example, the um, MRIs. Uh, we have handheld devices, which are the mobile. We have the small embedded technologies, and we have the micro, which is the, the sensors and controllers. That's the taxonomy we use in Internet of Things. Does that make sense? Okay, so customer perspective. Oh, it's very complex. Whenever I speak with a customer, it's like, it's very complex. Oh, nobody understands really what it is because Gartner says it's one thing, Forcer says another thing, IBC says another thing, then it comes G. Cisco, Microsoft, everybody has a different view. Strangely enough, they are always aligned to whatever they are doing. I never found out why. How strange is that? So it's very confusing. So many possible decisions. There is only one decision which is very difficult and will get you in a very, very bad point. It's not doing anything. That's the worst decision. Because if you try today, and if you start trying out your own stuff, doing your own sensors, cheap at home, in order to understand. Even if you fail in the first ones, you will have the experience of having failed and understanding how things work. The first times that I tried to assemble uh, a robot, you should see how it ended up. One of them burned, literally. It's like, oh, so cool. First time and the robot is done. Let's put it to work. <laughs> I don't think this was a feature I was expecting. But yeah, you have a very interesting feature. The smoke was really cool. Um, and there were things jumping around. So it was really, really cool. Um, but it's, it's a very confusing. So the strategy, the correct strategy is to start connecting device, trying to do M2M communications. How do I, in a controlled environment, can put a couple of sensors connecting and then I utilize that, I put that information into the cloud, I combine that data, enrich it, and then generate the insights. Good. Now, let me expand and add more and add more and add more. Don't try to go for a big bang, because the big bang will end up like my robot, with a bang. Actually, I, um, so <laughs> my wife is uh, very happy with me when I try to do some things. I convinced to, to get the, um, the high robot, the Hoover, that thing that goes through the house and you know that that thing is hackable, right? You didn't? It's hackable. Um, so I said, honey, let's buy this. This is so cool. This can help you, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, thinking from that perspective, yeah, it makes sense. So that thing arrives. She's not at home, <laughs> lucky me. First thing I do is, where is the thing that it takes the, um, the bag? So took it out, had the Raspberry Pi, shove it in, um, and start connect so you can connect uh, an external uh, brain into the thing. And you start connecting and sending information about where the device is. And supposing it was to make it smarter, supposingly, <laughs> the thing got dumber and dumber. Uh, then I unplugged and the damn thing didn't work again. So, <laughs> that's the things you need to do in order to, to get some things. And how does it work? It's a lot of devices, so it should be something like this, right? We all would love to be this guy. Okay, so the basics, we already went through them. Building a solution. We have devices, first thing. Plug the devices. If I'm using um, Raspberry Pi, I'm developing Java. If I'm using NetWinio, I'm developing .NET Micro. Um, I build the device. I start to understand how the device works, which type of status. If you have an Xbox, OK, I won't tell that. But yeah, you can use it as a device also. Don't hack it. Don't hack it. Uh, but you can use it as a device. Or use the um, Connect for Windows. That thing, I think it's, it's acceptable. Um, so start to understand what type of information is it providing. 
feed that into the service. So build the service. If you don't want to build a service, highly scalable service, then don't, don't build it. Use something like Azure Mobile Services, which allows you to get that ingestion. Then when you have that, we have the intelligence devices <coughs> into point and sending the right information. We connect to the cloud and provide scale and manageability. Then we start to build whatever interactions, insights. Because one of the things I learned about big data is, apart from the word be being absolutely nothing, um, because what is big data? Again, let's see how many different ideas we have. That's a new one. Never heard that one. It depends. I'm processing 10 terabytes. So it's 10 times that? Yeah. What about if I'm processing a megabyte? That might be. Um, so big data, and if you want to understand more, you can come to my talk tomorrow morning. Um, so big data has a map where you can understand what type. Big data, yeah. What type of data? What's the structure of the data? What's the speed of the data? What do I want? What type of analysis would I do? What type of processing would I do? Would I do streaming or batch? Only when you understand that, then you're not talking about big data. You're talking about the specific thing that you want to do with it. But one of the things I've learned over, over the years working in that is big data is only as good as your visualization is. Because nobody really <laughs> wants to look at all that bunch of bucket loads of data. They want to do and get the insights from that. So always, always do that part. So class of data, the large, some of the, some of the systems, a medium, of course. Um, I played around with some of those. Are, those are pretty cool. Uh, small POS systems and tiny uh, things like for example, uh, the, the chips, so system on a chip that comes with, with some of the devices, it's already been, been done in there. Now, some examples. IoT systems, who has home automation? I'm very sad, but I don't. Um, uh, health services, energy services, for example, managing a grid line. Uh, things like this which unfortunately doesn't have any applications installed. Things like this, who already wore one of this? It's pretty cool. Um, just a side note, don't try to use it when you're slightly drunk. Um, doesn't end well. Um, you end up recording when you shouldn't and not recording when you should. And you ask it to go to one place, but it doesn't understand you and you might end up in a very dodgy place. Not by experience, okay? Just I've heard a friend of mine. Um, so <coughs> home automations, gateways, uh, Raspberry Pis. Why is it the gateway? It's a way for me to connect that device to where the data should go. So a Raspberry Pi by itself is not the device. It's a gateway that allows me to connect devices into it. That's what the Raspberry Pi. And then I have nodes, which is my appliances. So the smart fridges. Have you, have you seen some of the smart house with smart fridges, which goes into the fridge and actually sends directly the, the, um, the shopping, shopping cards into the, the store and then you receive them and all of that? I want one of those, please. Really would love. Smartphones, um, you have Siri, Cortana, Google Now, everything, they are pretty cool. We go, we have a headset, and we are reading our, um, our messages. They get better and better because they have sensor information being stored, crunching the data and providing that intelligence, finding the patterns, doing machine learning algorithms. So let's go now to an example which is first going through this video because I think it makes sense. 
carrying more than one billion passengers every year, the iconic London Underground is the world's first underground railway. I'm Stu Pears, Managing Director at Talent Technology. We wanted to help rail organisations like London Underground modernise the systems that monitor its critical assets. Everything from escalators and lifts and HVAC control systems to CCTV and communication networks. Everything is connected. We teamed up with CGI Everything. and Microsoft. This collaboration includes taking advantage of the Microsoft Azure Intelligent System Service. Meaningful data from sensors and intelligent agents. This is the important part. Everything Visualizing from what's happening. Vibration Sending and alerts. Default warnings and system alerts are available securely in the cloud. Many manual monitoring processes can now be streamlined. Disconnected systems can be securely integrated and automated. Most importantly, equipment degradation can be spotted in real time based on live data. And with new insights from data, London Underground can measure asset performance over time. When one system can connect thousands of devices and data streams across a rail network serving millions of people, that's the Internet of Things, and it's here right now. That's why we chose Microsoft. So, this is real. This is here. We're using it every day. Unfortunately, it doesn't say that the, um, the tube trains need to be replaced. That would be cool all day. Um, but it actually, every single part in the tube is being monitored. Every asset is being monitored in real time. So this is the type of things that we can get. And an example is this. Um, this is the Azure Intelligence Service which has several parts. One is the intelligence service, which is the bus, the, the bus where all the events go through, which leverages event hubs, which is part of service bus. So millions and millions of, of status going through. Then it has elements on top of it in order to produce and analyze the data, and also ways for us to do things like data collection, remote access, content distribution, and all. It's a full end-to-end -end kind of system. And this is just an example of a system. So basically, I have a, a kiosk, I have the agent, and basically that is feeding into the event hub that gets processed, stored in memory, so I can store it in the Azure storage. I can have all of the things for real-time processing. It's now, but I can store it in order to do uh, processing afterwards, also in order to find the, uh, the patterns afterwards, in order to study and get more patterns. Another example is something we built in STC, which is our Insight Connect solution. What is this? This provides, uh, we're currently integrating with Azure Intelligence, but this provides a way to interact with the device. And so the demo I have is, so I have here my server, so I like to bring the offline demo just in case. First, I don't want to control a real car, um, and in reality, I couldn't control a real car. The max I can do is send an information to the car, an update, or say, you should do this, but I can't enforce the car to do anything, because that will be dangerous. Um, this is simulating the car, so this is the actual IVI of the car. Um, and, and that's what we have here. So what we have is, so let's go through, I have a system, so I have here um, an emulation of my client, so I'm connecting to this. Um, and what I have is my client, let me just go and connect in order for you to to see if you remember this type of this type of thing okay so i go into my car when i get in when i get in let me restart the So 
So let me clean, clean this up. And let me start it all over. Because I want to have the login experience. So one of the things that we started to, we started to see is that when we go into, into the car, now the cars have things like when I put my key in, in the car, he recognizes it's me. So he puts the settings for me. I can have, I have a, some cars that do that. Like for example, the, the, my rear view mirrors or my seat and everything. What's that doing is based on the sensor that I have in my key is basically identifying who am I and doing the authentication for me. And so what I'm going to do here is, uh, let's see if it's already on. What I'm doing here is, okay, uh, I go in and he already understood that it's me. I have my car, so you probably um, already know some of these things. It looks like a um, type of car system. Um, in, um, right? Does it seem like a car system? Okay. Cool. So the temperature, 74 degrees. Maybe we need to do something there. So what we, what we want to do, and one of the things that we are doing is, imagine I'm receiving all this information from all these cars. Now, every single car that I have has one of these information. So what I can uh, see is, for example, this car, which is a Chevrolet Cur uh, Curse, uh, Cruze, um, has not only one, but has several different base systems, base, base ECUs. Basically has several different sensors, processors in different elements, like the anti-lock brake system, manual air conditioning. It's all sensors that I want to receive the telemetry on. So basically what I can do, rear view mirror, um, I, can, I can go and see what version is it on. I can see this is the base element, but if I want to go, for example, for a different trim, I'll get this is a, a different version of that car. So I know exactly which element is in that car. And so if I go to the EVI entertainment system, my entertainment system, I understand which elements, which packages do I have, which version do I have, which restrictions am I imposing? Which components I have? Now, this information is happening. And I have my model ranges, I have my devices. Uh, so my devices are the cars. So I have the VIN number of a specific car. So in this case, what I have is I go in, now I go into my car, and I'm doing something. One of the things that is important is these sensors which are there which you normally go into the service they plug it in it's when they uh, they receive the information that's old-fashioned this uses mqtt so it actually is communicating and so if i do this it gave me an, inter an internal error and it reported it reported back to my system now I'll see that in my components, in my system, I'll have, um, I'll have in this segment, it should appear that I have a fault. And I can come here and see the fault of that system. I can understand exactly what caused that fault. Why is that? Why are there errors or on this element? What I can do then is, for example, so I have a problem there. I don't need to get the car serviced. <coughs> I don't need it. That's only a way to get, uh, get money out of you guys. Um, so what I can do is, let me go into this. 
I can do either through model ranges or to a specific car. So let me go to this car and say, okay, so I have the error here. It's in this car. If I go and look at the errors, so I can show the error, okay, it's in the entertainment, uh, entertainment system. So this is still a demo, it's in still in, in process. So it's in this system. I want to solve this problem. I don't want you to come into the shop, uh, but I want to solve it. Uh, I want to solve this problem. What do I do? I deactivate this system. I go and say, okay, I'm going to change from version one to version two in order to have that solved. So I have a bunch of elements. It's my AVI platform. Um, and I'm going to say, okay, so in my AVI system, what I'm going to say is I want to take one out and let's first here check which version I have. I have one. I, I take one out and put two. And I hit finish. And I'm in the server. I can be in the car manufacturer. I can be anywhere. And said, this car, this VIN number, needs to be updated to this, to this system. Or I called customer support. Would it be cool? My car had a, an issue. Uh, can you please upgrade my, uh, my software? I, I need to flash the ROM of my car. It's not breaking too well. Uh, so we go in, we do the change, we activate it. What we have is that now the system is sending the, the notification. So this system now, if I go here to the packages, which package it is, it's now in package two. And hopefully, hopefully, I'll get to install. And I now have my system updated. And this is, I have a sensor here, which is in this case, I'm only controlling one, which is my entertainment system, nothing else. Uh, but I could then, for example, <coughs> go in and, and say things like, okay, right, so, there are some, some other elements which I would like to have. Like for example, in this, I would like to have a couple of others in all this as uh, workflows um, attached and everything. So it's the IVI, so I can control, for example, do this for the cruise control. There are some things which we require that the, um, the car is stopped so that we don't destroy anything. Um, so in that case, uh, what we want to have is we'll send a notification and it updates. If it needs to stop the car, so we will send and say it will download. And when you stop the car, you just say, when do you want to do this? Okay. So, and in that case, I now send this new initial application set. And then basically this is to send things like Facebook or, um, or things like that into the system. So what I will have now, hopefully, I'll get that installed <coughs> here. Oh, I don't because I didn't activate it. Um, So what I will have is I can push, for example, applications into my entertainment system. Okay, so probably need to reset in order to, because apparently it's not connecting. Let me try to reset it real quick. So shut down, shut down, let me Clean. Let me 
can do the same thing for the other one. So. So I do SSH user X six. I'll connect to that that device. Come on. I'll connect to that device. Just do. Um, sudo, come on. Reset. Stop being stupid. Okay, try to restart it again. Sometimes the demo gods don't think like this. So that's the login experience. You wouldn't go through the login experience if you have a key, but this is the login experience. So I have, I'm connected. Now going to my system, I tried to log out. This was something that we made on purpose in order to create the error. I go in, I go into my device, say uh, there's a what's in here, uh, what's the segments that I'm that I'm using. So what's the applications that I have in there? Um, and and then So this has a little bit more already, more applications. Let me take this one again. So I have my platform in there, my software update modules, all of that. So if I go in and now go to my model, and I see my AVI, have that segment and say okay. So where is the I want to deactivate it and try again. And I want to push it in the new software update. I'm going to send the initial laps as well as change. STC component version two. So it gets processed. I activate it. So only when I activate it, it makes available. In this case, we have restriction. I can say this is only for systems of this specific type, or I can have restriction, which is for 
every type of car that has this. So let me see here. Why is this so cool when these things don't work? Activate packages. See. Let me deactivate it. Edit. It's my lucky day. It at least a thousand times, and now it doesn't like me. So that's ooh. okay. So you have that system, it does the update. We saw the update the first time. So it's important that you get the telemetry out of the box and then start processing it. Another, another system which uh, which is also interesting is this one here. So another another solution is, and this one I couldn't take the physical element because this is um, uh, an actual windmill uh, which is generating energy. So we basically uh, go in and we log in. We have the the same kind of system. And basically, what we have is sensors in the turbines, in the wind turbine, <coughs> understanding what's happening. So I can actually say, uh, I can see exactly what's the production, and I can adjust the production based on what I need, based on the, what the sensors are providing. So all of this, what is providing is I can drill down and now understand, okay, there is temperatures are high. Why are those temperatures high? Um, so we go into the threads and add a new comment, for example, and say, this is what's happening. And, and from there on, everything is connected. I can, as a, a manager of that site, of that system, I don't need a lot of things in order to understand how things are. And I can see the different sites. And basically, I can in real time understand which one of the turbines are working correctly, so are green. So I can see what's the assets, what's the power that it's generating and everything. Uh, how's that going? If I click in one of the points, I can understand in more detail what, what it's producing and then, then understand the trends. So what I'm having here is connecting all these elements and through, through this I have sensors in this is the, the wind turbines and I have my, my, the same thing for my cell towers all have sensors transmitting to a gateway which is then on the one network projecting and putting the information into our smart machine server something like this, but in a bigger scale. Uh, in this case, it's in the cloud. And then we are crunching the data with things like, in this case, Spark. And creating predictive analytics, prescriptive systems, and also some machine learning algorithms in order to provide this. So if we ask, uh, if we go and say, for example, in the cell tower, the problem is, the energy cost supporting 24-7. Do I need this to be constantly there? Maybe I can do something. The same thing that I have in the cloud, the same scale, maybe I can leverage the same type of thing. So same thing for the, for the cars. The objective is creating more and more <coughs> hybrid and green type of cars. So how can I do that if I don't have the sensors giving me that information and providing information because an example of M2M would be inside the car all the sensors are intercommunicating but it's internet of things when they are communicating also with the outside that becomes internet of things so that's that's what we have and one of the things that it's important to understand is 
Internet of Things is not science fiction. Internet of Things is not something that will be cool. It's something that is here already. We use it every day. All of our cars have this already. All of our grids are managed this way. All the data centers we are talking and using are already using automation. So it's here. It's, a, it's about us understanding the power and taking all the mist out of it. This is not um, something magical. No, this is device, millions and millions of devices interconnecting, sharing status in between themselves with the internet as a way to, uh, to communicate in between themselves. And when we do big data analysis, that's where we, we basically take the power of it and we create a marketplace. Because as soon as we have car manufacturers, healthcare companies, doing, going to that, that first phase, which is understanding, doing the insights, and then embracing this new type of, because this creates new, new type of, of businesses, then we'll have everything interconnected. And then we can do like minority report. You remember things like, I have this car. If I see it has this, this problem, if I jump in what, what generated or this is the state this part is in, I go in deeper and I can get it before it actually happens. That's a possibility. Because with the right sensor telemetry information attached and uh, processed with the right historical information, we will be able to do this. And there are already ontologies which allow us to do this. It's just very difficult to put together still. Okay, so hope you got a little bit better of what is Internet of Things and where we can use it and how we can use it. And hope you are going to all start uh, buying some new devices so I'm not the only one destroying stuff. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, personal attacks or other? Yeah. So MQTT is the protocol that they are using in order to, uh, to connect right now. So it's one of, the, uh, one of the several of them that we've been testing out. Um, and it's the one that we've been more successful. Um, and so it's, it's starting to gain momentum. There are, um, so I can tell you there is already um, a car brand, car dealer, that is leveraging this type of system with this system as I'm showing you in order to do this, in order to allow them to say, when I sell a car, it's not a car that I sell. It's an experience that I'm selling. And that means that when I buy one of those cars, when I grow up and, and get money together, um, so when I buy one of those cars, I'm not just buying the asset. I'm buying a lot, uh, the time that I have the car, I'm buying everything. So I don't know, I don't need to go to the, to the to the service in order for them to do an update on my system. I just sit, go there and when I get to say, I want to have your um, updates on my navigation system, which would be lovely uh, because that thing every now and then uh, tries to tell you to go to the wrong place. For example, today, my, uh, my navigation system said, in the next one, turn left. And I turned left and apparently everybody was looking at me and said, yeah, what? I'm following the navigation. But suddenly I look at the other side, it's like, okay, they changed the sign. Now you're mandated to go forward only in our turn left. Oh crap, can I blame on the navigation system? Is that allowed? Um, so those type of things, for example, having uh, pre, for example, pre get the, before things happen, go and say, I'm seeing that there is one tire that is not ha that is having a problem. So they call me. I'm one run going around everywhere, and they call me and said, "Oh, we've been seeing that your tire is having a problem. So do you want us to go and pick your car up? Uh, we'll leave a, uh, something, and then we'll we'll solve the issue." That's a different experience. Would you buy a car like that without knowing which brand it is? with an experience like that? 
If you knew the brand, you would buy even more. <laughs> Depend on the <laughs> on the on what you need to put on the check. More questions. If you're getting a lot of data. So dealing with the data, data injection is one of the biggest issues and challenges that, uh, that we face. And it's, it's a lot about, so one of the things is, I've been working uh, with Microsoft, and one of the things is like, oh, this system is only built and right now is in preview, so please don't uh, put more than a million uh, events uh, per second. Okay, so I plug it in and I send five million. Um, I'm hard <laughs> listening. So, and the, the way we're doing this is we try to package up the elements. First is that bus which is passing, that is real time. That is just sending the information uh, and then immediately something is picking it up and is logging and storing that information. And then we only have, for example, we don't store, because of the size of the data, we don't store all the all the data that we receive. We basically have, as soon as it arrives, it gets crunched, it gets enriched and placed how we want to consume it, and the rest we throw away because we can't deal with all that crap. So, but that's a decision. So for example, in, in um, medical uh, components, which I'm le uh, using some uh, with MRIs and things like that, that's a different story because you need to store those data. But also, in that case, the sensor information, even that the device has so many different sensors, I'm not storing everything, because that would be too much. So in that case, I store it, and basically we were storing something like a year or two years. But that was a decision. And in that case, we we're using storage and cold storage in order to leverage that. So at some point, we use dedupe, we use compression, all those things in order to make sure that everything is there. But it, that is one of the very complex elements. Connecting them is not a problem. When we start, so for example, I did a, my first demo of Internet of Things were a couple of devices like this. I built a, a solution for it. And uh, basically I placed it running and sending every time the gyroscope would, would move, it was sending the information, of the details. So I have like three or four and I threw it into the um, into the, the attendees and they were playing around and doing like this and playing around. So I thought this is not going to generate that many events. <laughs> How wrong could I be? Um, my credit card was on the other end. Um, so I discovered uh, that it's a bad idea to pull out jokes, jokes like that. But it was pretty cool to see uh, how things were. And I had systems doing things like you start doing this type of things and in real time I was using Nesper at the time. Do you guys know Esper or Nesper? It's a complex event processing uh, engine. Esper is the Java version. Nesper is the .NET port. And I was using uh, Nesper in order to uh, do complex event processing. So when the when the device, when the gyroscope would tell me that there was uh, a rotation and I was searching for something like more than three rotations uh, in uh, something like three seconds. Uh, so it show up in the middle of the presentation, something like I'm getting dizzy uh, and things like that. And if all of them, all of them together were getting dizzy at the same time, the screen would start uh, buzzing. It was pretty cool. But I didn't like my account, uh, my credit card account. So I stopped doing it <laughs> for some reason. But yeah, that's the biggest. But it's all about what type of information do you really need? Do you need the raw information? Are you doing anything with it? If you're doing, you need to do it fast. That's why Spark, for example, HD Insight or Hadoop, Cloudera, Hortonworks, um, MAPAR, all of those are pretty cool. Um, I've been using DUM and Spark, and Spark has been taking the, the edge because I can do a lot more. And 
basically, I do the complex event processing. I only get the ones that, for me, are interesting. I immediately crunch that and leave the information. The rest, I, I draw. Unless there is something saying you need to store this. But in that case, it's a customer that is paying. If it's not my credit card, I'm happy. Not my credit card. You mentioned when you started, you were a service channel. Yeah. Um, is that the service that you're talking about? No. So end service bus is a different thing. So service bus, Azure Service Bus, is a message, uh, a messaging system. Imagine message queuing in the cloud, highly available. That's that's a service bus. End service bus is is on top. So in SOA one. Um, how many of you know about SOA 1? Everybody. How many of you know about SOA 2 or advanced SOA? Event driven architectures. That's SOA 2. So, first, event, uh, the enterprise service bus, we started to put things like TIPCOs and bus talks and things like that. Men in the middle. Really cool, allowed to connect, but there was a problem. There was a single point of failure, right? So end service bus is the next gen, uh, like there is WSO2, for example, uh, which is a Java open source implementation of an ESB, which is, um, which is out of a scalable and provides, allows also complex event processing, things like that. End service bus is on top, you can connect it to, to service bus, Azure service bus also, and provides on top of that a whole bunch of a whole platform for you to provide metrics over that telemetry over what's going into the pipes and everything. Because what Azure Services provides is the pipe. What any service bus provides is the platform that sits on top of the pipe, makes it easier to operate, and makes it possible for you to see things like insights and things like that. So it's it's a pretty cool product. Uh, if you want to know more. I can present you to the owner of that thing, Woody, Woody Dahan, he's around. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's end service bus. Started as an open source project um, and, and it went beyond that. And it's a pretty, pretty good uh, option when you're doing, and because it makes an ESB like, but without the problem of the man in the middle. Uh, so. And the problem, I was, for example, in a telco, and sometimes I pull off, pull off that jokes. I was with the CEO, CEO of a, a telco, and telling about, hey, this thing is really cool, um, um, but you have this, you have a bunch of this talk servers. Um, this is a single point of failure. Yes, your orchestration is pretty cool, but it's a single point of failure. No, it's not. We have all VR and everything. And since I knew him well enough, I just said, okay, are you willing to bet on it? And he's like, I'm not following you. Are you sure this will not stop? This machine, which I knew exactly what it was, this machine is not a single point of failure. So if I take this cable off, <coughs> this won't stop your business. He's like, yeah, I'm sure. Go ahead. <laughs> And suddenly, all phones that were inside that building start ring, 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 ring. Suddenly, it's like, maybe there is a single point. And can you plug that back? Yeah. Plug it back. Everything is working. So what you need is a, an enterprise service bus, which is not in the middle. It leverages something like service bus, uh, but is not in the middle of the thing. It's actually looking and listening whatever is going on the pipe. And when it's something that it needs to do, it basically takes it, processes, and puts another message of another status. That's so too. That's where we should be. The problem is most of us and most of our systems are still in so one. And if in order to and that's one very important thing. To go into Internet of Things and to take advantage of the Internet of Things, you need to go to this kind of approach, event-driven architecture. There is no other way. Because all of that IT, uh, uh, IoT is only possible today because of that SOA2 event-driven architecture. OK? Any more questions?
No, there are, there are already data structures uh, that are going. Uh, there is the R, however I'm checking out, RF, RDF, um, which is basically we have is an ontology in ODF and uh, in RDF. And it basically you can, it's almost like a JSON type of format, but it allows you to do inferences also in that thing. So inferences will allow you to say, okay, um, I have this, this model. I can connect multiple different models like in the, uh, like having those, um, those, um, the brain maps that we have. So all that, then I, I get and take one element and then push the other element and all they connect and then I can zoom in. So I have a specific, it's very similar to JSON but it's also extensible enough for me to put inferences and things like, okay, one inference is saying that if I'm not saying that, oh, the status is one, then you go red. I'm just saying as inference for everything in this, uh, in this uh, ontology, so in this schema, uh, basically anything which is based on this rules, it's always rule based, then I need to do this and I don't, I don't tell anything, any specific node what to do. I just send an inference saying, this is rules. It's a rule-based engine. So that's why, that is the one that is currently being more used. But yeah, there will always be some crazy ass formats. And right now, when you go to sensors, Raspberry Pi, the, 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 the gateway, when you connect the sensor, the way that you get the information from a Raspberry Pi and from an app to Wino is completely different. They are propriety, so you need to do transformation on one to a single thing. What we're doing is putting that into RDF format in order to provide. And for example, what we do for interacting with service bus is since that thing is based on JSON, we basically serialize to JSON and send it through the wire. Any more questions? So thanks very much again and hope to see you tomorrow. Uh, just shameless plug, tomorrow, big data and enterprises and Azure uh, architecture best practices, which we're going to talk about architecture uh, patterns, uh, CQRS. Any of you have used CQRS? Cool. So it should be interesting. And as an example of things, um, for example, there is a device that is being used, um, tablet device, Android which is being updated and all the backend is built on the CQRS um, architecture. And one example is with a non-CQRS architecture, we had something like 200, 300 uh, requests being served per second on a single node, small machine. And when we did CQRS, we have about 10,000 being served by the same exact node, same exact size. So nothing special, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.